I'm going to go out on a limb and say that all the adults will understand what I'm about to say and some of the kids might not. Have you ever had like the worst stress dreams, the really bad ones? Hopefully the kids have no idea what we're even talking about, right? The ones that stick with you for a long time. Um, I, was a, um, I worked in the restaurant industry for something like 10 years before seminary, and about half that time I spent doing uh, fine dining, the sort of fine dining where uh, as, a, as a waiter, my job was at risk if I let somebody at a table pour his or her own wine, I better get there and I better see it and I better pour that wine before anybody hit, put their hand on the bottle, right? And, uh, and so I would have these dreams and I still to this day have these dreams where I am serving the biggest set of tables that I've ever, like I had the whole dining room and a lot of thirsty people <laughs> that just will not slow down. And so I constantly am sprinting, but all the wine glasses keep getting lower and lower. And once they are below half, I'm in trouble with my boss, and it just never ends. I will wake up in a cold sweat to this day. <laughs> Church can do that to uh, priests from time to time, too, by the way. Uh, we have those dreams from time to time. So I had one recently, and it was one of those dreams where I started off with the problem, something similar to that, like here's the setup that causes me all this stress. But I ended the dream so optimistic with the most vivid understanding of how an app on my phone was going to solve my problem. Um, so here's the problem. Like, you know that we are constantly... Uh, calling for volunteers, and we're looking for folks all the time, right? In my version of this dream, we needed like a million new volunteers, a uh, hundred in each one of the different ministries in this church, and somehow I was responsible for finding all of them. But then some friend of mine told me about an app on my phone where I could just pull it up and I could say, like, we want to start a new youth ministry thing, and it would say, well, you need this volunteer and this volunteer and this volunteer and this volunteer, and then it would make suggestions, like, oh, you need to call Wendy Waller over here and have her, which we do, by the way, and Wendy knows it. <laughs> She's, um, and so I woke up believing that that app existed, <laughs> and I went straight to my phone. <laughs> I was like, this is the solution to my lower scale problem, that here's my solution. And sure enough, it's not on there. <laughs> Candy Crush was still there, but not that app. <laughs> Those stress dreams are uh, universal. Anytime anybody gets invested in something and puts one's heart and mind and soul into something, those stress dreams are going to come. I assume anyway. I, I mean, it's only my experience, but I've heard a lot of your other ones because sometimes people will come in the office during the week and share uh, their stress. Uh, I, I totally, totally understand it. It can be so stressful. Uh, today we get a little picture of the moment that Peter kind of wakes up from his stress dream, I think. And... Uh, and we just caught like two or three verses, so I'm going to back us up a little bit and check back into it, but uh, it's the moment where Peter seems to realize that the app actually does exist on his phone, where he says, oh, look, this, God's done this amazing thing that I would have never thought was possible, and it's real. That vision that I had, that, that vision that I had for how this could work out, it's real, um, to understand even a, a sliver of what I'm talking about, if you've never heard this before, you actually have to back up, and I'm not going to read it to you. It's an entire chapter in the book of Acts. We've been reading through Acts for weeks now, trying to understand what is similar and what is different about their experience from our own. And this is one of those places where I think, again, we have such similarities. Um, at this point, the faith that Jesus had placed in his disciples, this command to love one another as he had loved them to lay down their life for one another— um, has started to spread, and that community of love living so differently in the early church had grown and grown and grown, but it was still primarily a Jewish experience. Um, not yet had the church accepted that that kind of love might break down more barriers than they had previously expected. Last week, we heard a little bit about the, the Ethiopian eunuch and how that was another place where that love just crashed through what was previously conceived as a barrier. And isn't that what Jesus' love always does, right? Um, they name a scene in the, in the Gospels where Jesus, by his love, is not taking some wall that we build and just crashing through it to say, no, that person's not outside the wall. That person's actually inside too. Um, so, uh, so the disciples have picked up this ministry but have not yet figured out a way to translate it into a ministry that goes out into the world and takes a whole group of people that they would call Gentiles and allows them to be understood as being on the right side of God's love, right? Um, 
So we catch a little sliver of that last week. Paul has not come into the picture yet. You'll expect that ministry to be done by Paul, and it will. But before it happens with Paul, it happens with a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius is a, a Roman soldier, a centurion, and he is uh, named in this book of Acts as a God-fearing person, which means that somewhere in his heart, he believed in the God that the Jewish people, uh, whom he had been living among for uh, maybe years, he believed in their God, uh, but he had not become a Jewish convert. Uh, he had not, well, we'll just say he had not been a Jewish convert. Well, <laughs> some of y'all will understand what I mean by that, and, and that's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> so, uh, so Cornelius ends up having this vision as well. He has a dream. And, uh, and in his dream, God says to Cornelius, uh, you've done all this wonderful stuff. Now go to this place called Joppa, and there you will find a man named Simon. Um, and when you get there, just make sure that Simon knows that I've sent you, uh, basically. And, <clears throat> and so uh, he goes. But while those men are going, I'm sorry, his men go. While his men are going, Peter is also having a dream. Uh, he goes up onto his rooftop to pray. And it says he falls into a trance, which is, my guess is he falls asleep sunbathing. <laughs> and he gets, uh, gets this vision that it happens three times. And it's a vision of a sheet that comes down from heaven. And on that sheet are all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds and all sorts of other stuff. But remember, the Jewish people have a very strict understanding of what animals would be considered clean and which animals would be considered unclean. And this sheet, which I mean, we might almost think of as a picnic blanket, is coming down from heaven with all sorts of animals that are unclean. And God says to Peter, eat. Anything on the blanket's good. And Peter is not capable of understanding what God is saying to him. How can these things be clean? For thousands of years, our people have avoided eating this rock badger or whatever it is. How could that possibly be clean? And God says, anything that I call clean is clean. Don't worry about your religion. Don't worry about your purity. Listen to me when I say that if I call it clean, it's clean. So Peter finishes his dream, and he wakes up, and sure enough, the app's not on his phone. He wakes up, and there is no blanket, there is no food. But it does say that he's hungry, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> All of a sudden, knocking at his door are these men who have been sent by Cornelius. And they say to him, our Gentile Roman soldier has had a dream where God has sent him, sent us to you to bring you back to him to teach him the things about Jesus. And it snaps into Peter's mind suddenly that that person, that entire group of people that he once thought were unclean are no longer unclean. And he just gets up and goes. Says that he travels with them and he arrives in Cornelius' house. Cornelius falls at his feet to worship him and he says, no, please don't do that. I'm not, I'm just a guy. And as he stands up, he says, I was sent for and I came without objection. Why did you send for me? And Cornelius says, four days ago at this very hour at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Go find Simon. And so I sent for you and did what God asked me to do. And Peter began to say, now I understand truly that God shows no partiality. And he begins to tell him the things about Jesus that he himself had learned. And all of a sudden, in that moment that he is describing these things, not only Cornelius, but all the other Gentiles in the room with Cornelius suddenly have this experience of, experience of the Holy Spirit, of the power of God's love that enters into him. And Peter is shocked and he steps back. I mean, this is a moment that is similar to the moment of Pentecost. Something he truly didn't understand could be shared with these Gentiles. And he steps back, and that's when he says the line that we get today. What is to prevent us from baptizing these people on whom the Holy Spirit has come? Right? You see that whole scene? How is God going to do this thing? And then he has this dream that's unbelievable, and he has no idea how it's going to connect. And all of a sudden, there's the answer. And he goes, and he does. And God has done what God has said God was going to do. It's unbelievable and out of that work will extend the, the spreading of the gospel that goes all the way to Rome, to the heart of the empire, and therefore to the rest of the world. 
And all of it to me is an extension of the love that Jesus had. The ministry, we might say, that Jesus had to reconcile all people in Christ's love. When Jesus says to his disciples that I'm the vine and and you all are um, the branches. You are the extension of this love. I am the source of it. You go out into the world and you bear this fruit that's just like my love so that your joy may be complete. This, to me, is one of those moments where we get to see it happening. And it looks like reconciliation. It looks like love crashing through a barrier that you and I, we humans, so often artificially establish to divide us from one another, right? That's what Christ's love looks like to me. I bring that up because um, one of my great stress dreams about the church is whether or not we are doing that work. Whether or not when we look around the room, we see the fruit that we have born into this world based on that reconciling love of Christ. And there are moments where I say, absolutely, look, and I know enough stories in the room to know there are so many folks for whom this is, um, this is that fruit. And then I watch sometimes as someone else struggles with that same exact experience. And they'd see it from the other side and say, oh, there are still too many walls. At this church through the years, we have um, found that doing the work of Christ with regard to, say, diversity. And when I say diversity, I don't mean just ethnic diversity. But that has been exceptionally challenging. There are moments in the life of this church within the last 20 years where it has seemed like this church could be ripped apart at its seams because of the nature of the church doing its best to find a place where God is crashing through a wall that we previously had understood, where we think that God may have called something clean that we've previously called unclean. And what has held us together so often is the ability to understand that God has done that for us. That I once was considered unclean and God made me clean. And if God can do that for me, God can do that for anyone. God can do that within this community in small ways. God can do that within this community in large ways. And every single time we have done that, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how painful it can be, we found joy. Not pleasure, mind you. Joy. The fulfillment that comes from our calling. When Jesus uses that word with his disciples, if you love one another the way I have loved you, then your joy may be complete. It's the joy that comes from fulfilling our calling, not the pleasure that comes from being happy. I challenge you, I challenge us as a church, I challenge myself as an individual and as a leader within this church to hold the importance of that ministry of Christ as second to none. Right? That if we accomplish all these other tasks that we would say are associated with church, but we've done it in such a way that we are not exercising the reconciling love of God in this world, then we have divorced ourselves from the early church and we have cut ourselves off from our true vine. We have become branches that bear no true fruit. It might look good, but it's not Christ's loved within us. I hope that makes sense. I hope that can awaken you and perhaps open your eyes to see that reconciling love at work in this community, but then to own it as your ministry too. No matter where we go together, no matter what we do, that has to be what we are about. This church says it all the time, that we are about transforming lives through the love of God in Christ. And there is no greater version of that transformation that Christ does through Christ's love. And to take one who is formally considered unclean or formally considered outside of God's love and to say, welcome home. There is no greater joy for us 
and to accomplish that work. And there is no higher calling. Let us answer that call in our lives and find our joy made complete. Amen.